Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Today, I would like to tell you about a very nice method to, to kind of check whether a functor has an adjoint. It's called the adjoint functor theorem. And in my running example, kind of I would like to uh, explain why this includes that identities are free. I could also have taken something like free vector space exists. Um, I will comment on that later on. But I decided to go with a different example example um, of that identities are free. We'll see what that means. But in the end, it's all about kind of deciding whether a functor has an adjoint or not. Um, so let's have a look at a certain situation. Our hopefully uh, by now uh, most favorite situation ever with the nicest category on the right hand side and well, not, not, not a super bad one. Uh, on the right hand side. Sorry, I should have said it was the nicest one on the left hand side. So K vector spaces on the left. And kind of this nice adjoint uh, pair here of uh, free and forget. Um, the only thing I always forget myself, so I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, forgetful in the sense of this forgetful factor is which one is left, which one is right. But I wrote it down here. So I hope it's, it's correct. The free forget adjunction, free is the left adjoint, forget is the right adjoint. And you can check actually that this junction preserves limits and co-limits or co-limits and limits. So uh, the free functor preserves co-limits and the forgetful functor preserves limits. Um, one can think of kind of the terminal objects or uh, uh, initial objects. So a terminal object, for example, would be uh, the one point set here just one point or then point, whatever. And it certainly comes from, from the zero space here. And it's kind of preserved in this direction. So the one point zero is the terminal object in vector spaces. And the one point set is the terminal object in set. And the forgetful functor preserves uh, this limit. And similarly, the free functor will preserve the core limits. And this is true in general. It's not hard to, to show actually that all uh, adjoint functors are continuous or co-continuous, depends a bit which one is left, which one is right, but it's not really so hard to decide. And the question uh, the adjoint functor theorem would like to answer is, what about the converse? So um, if we have a continuous functor or co-continuous functor, whatever, is it actually a, an adjoint? So can you find an adjoint functor or not? So what about the converse of the theorem? So here's another example, kind of the running example uh, I would like to, uh, to explain in this setup here, the adjoining of units. So we have a category ring, right? The category of rings, rings are objects and ring homomorphisms are arrows. This is on the right-hand side here. And that is a funny kind of like a cousin category of it. Uh, it's called RNG. So the I is dropped and this is just exactly the same but you don't demand that rings have an identity. Uh, for example, um, here in rings, you always have an identity, of, an identity in your ring, the unit, and here you ne don't necessarily need that anymore. And that's why it's called RNG. So rings without identities, if you want. So you drop the I. Anyway, it's kind of really, really, they're closely related categories, obviously. And um, every ring is an RNG. <laughs> I'm actually not quite sure how to pronounce it, but anyway, um, any ring, anything on the left hand side goes to the right hand side because yeah, it's it's, it's if you have an identity, good for you, but you don't need it. So um, yeah, sure, you just lo look at the ring as an RNG just by by not uh, paying paying attention to the identity at all. So that's an inclusion functor from left to right. Okay, and the question would be kind of. I would like to address here, does this inclusion functor actually have an adjoint functor? Remember here we had, it's kind of like a forget functor if you want. Uh, you forget that you're actually a ring and you go to RNGs. So do you have some kind of free functor in the opposite? There are kind of a free functor in this opposite direction. So is there one? So that's really adjoining a unit. So is there an adjoint unit functor? Is adding units possible? So by units here, I mean identities. Is it actually possible? So is there a free functor from ING to ring or not? So how can you check that? Well, we know the, we know from the slide before, or well, actually I just said it, it's not really on the slide, but there's something true in general. 
So adjoint functors are continuous and co-continuous. So the first thing you might want to do here is to just check whether the inclusion functor preserves co-limits or limits. Um, if it doesn't, then you know it can't be a left or a right adjoint, whatever it is. For example, the inclusion from the, the integers is just the integers, but now it's an R and G. But it's not initial anymore because of this condition of having a unit. It's just not there anymore. So uh, the, the integers is the initial object here, but it's not the initial object here. So um, it doesn't preserve co-limits. A little bit confusing. The initial object is a co-limit and the terminal object is a limit. So it doesn't preserve co-limits. So it can't be, well, let's have a look at whether this is actually correct. It can't be a left adjoint because the left adjoint preserves co-limits. So it can't have a right adjoint. Very confusing. So a right adjoint can't exist because the functor itself cannot be a left adjoint. It doesn't preserve co-limits. And then you would play along around with uh, uh, limits a little bit. For example, inclusion of the zero object is a terminal object. And you can play around with other limits. And you will see that it's always, always preserved. So you, you can't really rule it out. So this probably means there should be a left adjoint. We can't quite tell, um, but it probably should mean that there's a left adjoint. So if you want to test it's kind of the, the mini version of the theorem already, if you want to test whether a functor, a functor a left adjoint or right adjoint exists, just throw, throw a lot of limits and core limits into your functor and see what happens. And if they're not preserved in the correct way, you know that there are no uh, left or right adjoints in the correct setup. So that's what's happening here. So core limits are not preserved. You can't have right adjoints. Whatever kind of limit you feed in, they will be preserved. So it's really a good hint that there should be a, a left adjoint actually. And the main idea, kind of the main idea of the theorem now is that we should be able to rebuild the left adjoint by using um, the knowledge what happens on the limits. It's a little bit like this picture. So I struggled a little bit to find a good picture to have in mind, but it's a bit like this. So if you know a function f of x, this is this uh, red one here, and you want to know its inverse, and the adjoint is kind of a little bit of an inverse, there's a very nice procedure to just get the inverse uh, from the function itself. And as soon as you know kind of the function everywhere and your underlying space is not too stupid, uh, you can actually construct the function uh, f inverse from f in a very straightforward and pretty nice way. So with enough data given, you can actually do that. So what I'm saying here is, in some sense, with enough data given, we should be able to construct the adjoint functor from knowing what happens on limits or co-limits. This um, kind of should in, in, include that something here is complete. Right? So if you don't have enough limits or co-limits, that probably shouldn't work. But if it's complete, then that would be a good chance. Well, so the ring is complete and the inclusion preserves all limits. So this should enable us to actually construct, as I said, uh, the inverse, the adjoint functor um, from this data. And that's kind of what, what, what's happening. Um, it's not quite what's, what's happening because not, it's just not always true. So there will be an additional condition somewhere uh, you will see it on the next slide, but it's kind of what the whole point is. It's also kind of how you um, prove the following theorem. It's called the adjoint factor theorem. So given enough data, so given a functor C to D, and we assume that C is complete, it's kind of this, if C wouldn't be complete and you, you shouldn't look at limits anyway. Um, G is continuous. We kind of want to have the uh, opposite of being continuous. And a certain condition holds, so the so-called solution set condition. Solution set condition, SSC, uh, I've written it down here. It's kind of this obstruction you need to check whether this is true or not. And if it's true, I will just go through it. If it's true, then G actually has a left adjoint. And you could construct the left adjoint by looking at a certain, uh, certain limit, but by kind of constructing it from what you know what happens on the limits. So having a left adjoint means that G is actually a right adjoint. Very confusing. But anyway, so the above can be restated uh, if you want as follows, which is kind of the way to remember it. So let's say there is some completeness condition involved. As I said, otherwise the whole notion of continuous is a little bit shaky anyway. 
So let's say there's some continuous condition involved, uh, some completeness condition involved. And then a functor has a left adjoint if and only if it's continuous and satisfy this SSC condition here, right? It's kind of not quite it's if, if and only if it's continuous, but it satisfies this additional condition. And obviously there's some dual statement about uh, right adjoints and so on and co-continuous. And that's kind of nice. So we can kind of check whether a functor um, is has a left adjoint by looking at the limits, right? So whatever, whatever it does to limits. And as soon as you've kind of checked enough limits, you convinced yourself it probably has an adjoint in the, in the correct order, you should check the SSC condition or the dual SSC depends a bit uh, on the precise statement you are up for. Uh, let's come back to our <laughs> ING example. So the same example, um, actually to spoil the story, so inclusion satisfies the SSC condition and discontinuous. Um, so yeah, this functor has a, at joint, so there is a free way of assigning a unit to something without a unit, so an identity. Um, and the kind of the way to check is would be, for example, you could assume that you don't know that this is possible. This was kind of known before the adjoint functor theorem, but let's assume we don't know that. Um, then the adjoint functor theorem would actually prove that this is possible. So the adjoint functor theorem would prove for you that it's possible to adjoin a unit to this situation. And I just picked this situation of ring and ING because I wanted to present ING. Uh, well, no, not really, because I kind of think it's a good example, but this works in, of course, more generality. You can kind of adjoin um, identity objects to, uh, to semi-groups, for example. And from groups to semi-groups, it's really just the same, the same setup. And this, this adjoint is kind of the universal way of adjoining a unit to your ING. Uh, so let me wrap up. So the adjoint factor theorem is kind of uh, the statement of, well, adjoint factors are continuous. What about the converse? The converse is not quite true. It's not like adjoint factors if and only if continuous functors, right? So they're not the same notions, but there is this little SSC condition, but up to the SSC condition and assuming that continuous is not completely stupid, like you have complete domain, uh, they're actually the same notions and that's the adjoint factor theorem which in words just want to, or in, in practice, just want tells you that in order to check whether something has an adjoint, you should look at whether it's continuous or co-continuous. So you should look at what happens to limits or co-limits. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.